guys, and welcome back to Dark Matter Podcast. Today we have a special bonus episode for you. We wanted to share this because today is the sixth year anniversary of this tragedy, and we really felt that it needed to be shared so more people knew about it. I first heard about this a couple years ago and thought it was so sad, and it really stuck with me. I'm Dominique. And I'm Avalon. And today we're going to be talking about the Seawall Ferry tragedy, and this is a national tragedy that occurred in South Korea in 2014, and we definitely want to talk about this because we want to bring more attention, and we definitely could learn a lot about what happened in this situation, so we definitely wanted to share it with more of you guys, and we wanted to bring attention to it, like we said. So, a reason we chose this um, particular case to talk about is because we wanted to focus more on, like, systematic crimes rather than individual ones. Um, a lot of people, you know, really focus on that with serial killers and individual cases, but I feel like this one's definitely interesting because, you know, it deals a lot with, like, government and just a lot of systematic corruption, like we mentioned before, and there are a lot of things in this case, like, that went wrong that I feel like could have gone right if things were done properly. So we definitely wanted to share that with you guys. Yeah, for sure. And I think, um, you know, the way I think of it is in true crime, like the true crime genre, a lot of times people pay attention to the psychological side, um, which with psychology, we focus on the individual. So like, for example, what went, what went wrong in their life um, to make them like this or like what individual crimes they committed, you know, especially with serial killers. Um, And that's really what the focus is on, is on the individual. But what I'm more interested in um, is like the sociological perspective, which is more like taking a step back and looking at like, well, what what was structurally wrong to allow this to happen? Like what um, like like what went wrong at a bigger picture, like or a bigger bigger level, not just um, this one person, you know, killed a bunch of people. What's wrong with the government or what's wrong with the the way that um you know corporate companies are set up to allow things like this to happen so i'm more interested in like the um like repeating patterns and corruption like on a higher level um and of course that doesn't mean like we don't ever want to focus on psychology and focus on these individual cases and like the crazy just bizarre ones um you know we find those interesting too just like everyone else Um, But I think we want to be productive with what we put out with our podcast and we want to focus on underlying societal issues so that, like I said, we're being productive and we're um, kind of just like spreading awareness rather than just focusing on these individual issues, which of course there can be meaning taken from the individual cases. But really the reason I think they're popular is just because they make you go like, what the hell? Like, why did, why did that person do that? Um, When I think it can be possibly more productive to focus on okay why did this government allow this to happen or what's wrong with the way we think about things that you know this this ended up happening or they didn't take action or whatever it might be so that's kind of the theme of today's case yeah so um let's get right into it so on april 16 2014 250 of 375 south korean high school students drowned aboard a ferry that they were on for a school trip to jeju island and a total of over 300 passengers were killed including a couple of non-student passengers as well right and so on board there was a total of 475 passengers including everyone Um, And there's also 180 vehicles and roughly 1,200 metric tons of cargo. And just for context, uh, the ship's capacity was 921 passengers. So 475 were on board, 921 was the capacity. So obviously there wasn't too many people, but the capacity for vehicles, like the, the max amount of vehicles it could take, were 130. And there was 180. So there's 50 too many vehicles. So obviously it was overloaded and we'll get into that later. Yes, so an article by the Straits Times pretty much gave us a clear timeline of what happened on that day. So on 8.52 a.m., a call between a 911 operator and a passenger aboard the Seawall Ferry um, called about the boat tilting on its side and was sinking. And then at 8.49, the Seawall starts to sink. At 9.25 a.m., a call between the Jindo Vessel Traffic Service and the Seawall Ferry Um, is made and it says that an escape call should be made on the captain's judgment however passengers were told to stay put and not to move and you know and I feel like if the order to abandon ship was given then a lot of students would have survived because they would already have been um, close to the exits and it definitely would have been a lot easier for them to escape you know when the boat was still slightly above water rather than 
you know, underneath. And there's actually a video clip, you know, this is the sad part, there's a video clip of a student saying, you know, like, isn't this the kind of situation where they tell you to stay put and it'll be okay and they actually run away for their lives? And unfortunately, that statement proved to be very true in this case. Yeah, for sure. I think that sometimes people might hear about this case and think like, well, why didn't they just jump off? Why didn't they just, you know what I mean? Like, why didn't they just mm-hmm. get themselves out of the situation? But you have to think about like when you're a teenager, you're on this boat and you are told stay put, you're going to trust the person telling you to stay put. You're not going to mm-hmm. do what they tell you not to. I mean, obviously, like they know more about it than you. Right. So I would have stayed put. And unfortunately, that was the issue is that people, you know, trusted them. Um, and moving on by 930, the ship was already at a 60 degree angle in the water. So rapidly just sinking. Um, and at this point, So like I was saying, some people decided, you know what, screw it. Like, we're not going to stay in here anymore. We're going to die here. So they started um, ignoring the recommendation to stay in their cabin. And they just started jumping ship. And um, there was one case of a 61-year-old woman who ditched her cabin after it started filling with water. So clearly people were like, okay, yeah, we're going to die. Like, they told us to stay here, but we're going to drown. So we're just going to go anyways. Um, mm-hmm. But unfortunately, not everybody did that. Yeah, um, a mo- majority of the students actually did stay where they were, like they stayed in their cabins. And I think that has a lot to do with the society in Korea. You know, it's a very hierarchical um, society. You definitely listen to your elders. You stay put. That's why, you know, when the order to stay put is given, they stay put. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it is a societal thing because like I was saying, maybe from like our perspective as Americans, we're like, oh, well, screw it. Just do what is right Mm -hmm. to you. You know, that's kind of like our individualistic tendencies to be like, well, just just do it anyways. Like, you know what's better. But for them, it's very like, yeah, like you said, it's it's, there's very much um, a culture of respect. And like you Mm -hmm. you listen to your elders and you're not going to step out of line. So it makes sense that they're like, okay, we're just going to stay here. That's what we were told to do. Yeah, definitely, you know, and like you said, that definitely hurt in the end. So at 9.35 a.m., patrol boat 123 arrives, and it is the only commanding rescue boat at the scene that has communication with the Coast Guard headquarters, and they report when they arrive on scene that they don't see any passengers yet and no one has jumped into the water. At 9.47 a.m., there is a video footage recording the captain escaping to patrol boat 123, despite the fact that if you are a captain, you are sworn to go down with a ship. So you're supposed to go down with the ship. You're supposed to be the last one escaping. However, this is is like he escaped and he definitely was being selfish. He wanted to save his life. And, you know, half the passengers were still on board when he left. So he definitely was abandoning his ship. He definitely did not do his job properly. Yeah. And I think that's probably the part that pissed me off the most is that the captain himself um, just ditched. He, He got off the ship and he left everyone to die essentially and um just to clarify when the captain left the ship everyone like the last order anyone had gotten was stay put he didn't Mm -hmm. tell them to leave when he left so all they knew was okay we're gonna stay here meanwhile the captain's leaving and not telling them that they need to leave as well so he it's almost like he wanted them to die it's just so so awful Mm -hmm. Um, So moving on, so at 10 a.m., the first helicopter arrived and started um, rescuing passengers from the side of the water that was, or the side of the ferry that was still outside of the water. Um, But instead of intensifying the rescue operation, the government agencies just repeatedly requested a camera to be sent in for internal reporting. So obviously they're more concerned with how they're going to look rather than actually saving anyone. Um, and so there, there was, or though there was a helicopter on the scene, um, neither the helicopter or patrol boat 123 um, gave any instructions to the passengers about what to do. So, like I was saying, um, at this point, like although they were there, like there was there was rescue, like an, a rescue operation happening, they weren't giving them in, any instructions. So people were just rapidly dying at this point, um, or well, they were about to. Um, and patrol boat patrol boat 123. Uh, was the only Coast Guard boat at the scene. So it was the only one for all these people. And the others were small fishing boats that just happened to be there. Um, They only approached the Sewol once um, they hung back after the ferry sank. So it it was basically just hanging out, not doing anything. And again, there was one boat to save all these people that were on the ship. Obviously, it was not going to work, you know. Um, And then moving on to 10, 18 a.m., the captain of patrol boat 123 ordered the fishing boats to retreat. So they they told him to leave. 
Moving on to 1035, at this point only the tip of the bow is above water, so pretty much the, the ship is almost completely underwater. Um, and there was a call between the Air Rescue Service and the West Sea Coast Guard, and they said that um, there are no more passengers left in the ferry. That's what they said. And um, they said, quote, we did not search the cabins, but it seemed most of them are out, end quote. So pretty much they said, like, from our deductions, there's no one left. So they didn't even check. They didn't even check, but they were like, oh, it's all good. Like, everyone's out. Yes, they did not. They they didn't really look. And it's just crazy to me because it's like, there's a specific number of people on this ship. You know mm-hmm. that there is. So for you to be like, yeah, it looks like most of them are out. You can count them. You can, you can like, estimate it. Like, this is four or how many people was it total? It was like 475. That's a lot of people, and so many of them died. So to be like, oh, yeah, it seems like most of them did. Like, no, obviously most of them were not saved. That's insane that they actually Mm -hmm. thought that or they're actually going to say that, that, like, most of them were fine. Um, And, yeah, so then the government went on to report to the public that everyone had been rescued. They So that was just complete misinformation because, I mean, unfortunately most of them died. Um, mm-hmm. And then a huge part of this case, like a big scandal, was the the South Korean president at the time, President Park Geun-hee. That's how you say it, right? Park Geun-hee, yeah. Um, so she had emerged from her room at the end of the day, and it appeared that she had, like, just a limited understanding of what was going on. So pretty much it, it seemed like she was just chilling all day in her bedroom, just hanging out. And then she came out of her room at the end of the day didn't really know what was going on, wasn't involved. And this is, like, a huge national tragedy, you guys. Like, this is obviously, like, all these people mm-hmm. were dying. And she just came out of her room leisurely, you know, like, didn't really know what was happening. So that just, you know, speaks volumes to the way the government handled it. Yeah. And so it was 11 a.m. when the first fatality was reported, and at 11.20, the ferry had sunk completely. So not even the boat was above water. So the next day, a group of civilian divers arrived on the scene to assist the Coast Guard and rescue the 291 passengers that they were believed to still be trapped on the ship. And they believe that if there were air pockets, you know, that were trapped in small spaces of the ship, that there still could be survivors. But the Coast Guard told them they had to pump air into the ferry, you know, to increase oxygen. And one civilian diver said that the Coast Guard's equipment was so old that it could give out before they even reached the kids, but they insisted that they had to at least pretend since the president was there and she was watching, which to me is just so irresponsible, you know, like, even if the president is there and you feel like you have to do the job, like, why not do it properly? Like, what does it help to do it, like, improperly? It won't help at all, like, it would probably make the situation worse. Yeah, that's so pathetic that they were like, oh, well, like, this is literally not going to help, but we have to pretend for the president. Like, it's all just smoke and mirrors. This whole thing was just a facade to make it seem like they were doing the right thing. I mean, like, to me, this was, uh, like, Mm mind-boggling that they let this happen. This was in the morning, right? It all started happening, like, like 9, 10 a.m. So this is all happening in the morning. And the next day is when they came back to get the people. They're like, oh, yeah, we'll just save them tomorrow dude they're dead like like is that so hard to like comprehend like they're obviously dead it's been a whole day like that just pissed me off so much that they were so leisurely about this Mm -hmm. and like it seemed that they were or not even it seemed it was obvious that their priority was all about how it looked like oh we're gonna pump air in because the president's here we want it to look good and we're gonna send in the air or we're gonna send in like you know um, a camera to see how it so we can tell the you know the public what's going on or, mm-hmm. or try to ease their worries but not actually save anyone so it was really just about how they look and how um the public's going to perceive it when meanwhile all these people were dying pretty much yeah and you know honestly i think like this situation was just horrible from the beginning like the rescue operation was not well done and then this next step was not well done also so what happened was a a coast guard diver came out and reported that he had successfully attached the air hose but another diver said that he should have first searched the spots like you know if air was trapped if there were any rather than just attach it somewhere outside the ferry but they had to report a successful operation to the president so they just staged it and however you know unfortunately the rest of the ship sank before morning and no more passengers were able to be rescued So over the next three months, civilian divers worked to retrieve the bodies and belongings of the victims because no government divers were skilled enough to retrieve the bodies in the 40-meter deep sea. So it was all civilian um, 
civilian divers and they all volunteered their time to do this. Right. And that's crazy to me that like the the government divers weren't skilled enough. Like we talked about this earlier. Like, what does that even mean? Like, so it had to be like random people who just happen to know how to dive. They were more skilled than the people they had hired to do this. Like, I don't understand that at all. Yeah, the government divers were definitely unqualified, which is so confusing to me because, you know, like government, I would feel like that would be the one where you would need the highest qualification. Right. And I think, well, it'll be obvious very soon, but like the people who did volunteer their time were absolutely heroes. And like they, um, they, they were like the heroes of the story, really. Yeah, definitely. And so one of the civilian divers, John Guanggun, was actually there from April 17th to July 10th, and he retrieved about 25 to 30 bodies. So according to him and other civilian divers, there was really bad visibility, you know, due to the the like the soil and then the layout of the ferry was so complicated that they had to set up guiding ropes and then one of the civilian divers kim guang hong actually said that they had to grope around in dark water and those images will be stuck forever in his mind he would dive up to four to five times a day even though he was only supposed to go once and he described his experience saying quote when we left the scene there were small birds in the rain and wind Those birds were flying around in the storm. The birds were so tiny and beautiful, and their call so touching, but it sounded like the students wailing, asking me not to leave them behind. So he definitely criticized the Korean government, and he said that they wouldn't even have been needed if they had saved those kids when they could have been saved. And, you know, unfortunately, he would eventually commit suicide two years later after the Seawall Ferry incident. Yeah, and I think that this is one of the biggest tragedies, like, or biggest, like, like parts of the tragedy I guess that stuck out to me is that like Mm -hmm. this man ended up committing suicide and he wasn't even connected to what happened like it's not like one of his kids died it's not Mm -hmm. like he knew anyone who was on board he was just a civilian that was dedicating his time to help this community and like help you know get the parents at least get their body like the bodies of their children back right and the fact that yeah to get closure and the fact that he ended up committing suicide and like what he said about the birds and how it sounded like um the students wailing it was just so like poetic and heartbreaking and the fact that he ended up um being so tormented by this that he did commit suicide is just so so awful this was so heartbreaking on so many levels yeah Uh, and we i definitely want to share that too because i feel like it is so important like these people helped so much they were able to retrieve so many bodies and give closure to so many families that it just is heartbreaking to me that he definitely suffered for that, you know, so I definitely wanted to bring him to attention and give him the credit that he is most definitely due. Right, like I said, he was, he was a hero, Mm -hmm, and um, so these divers, like you mentioned, they were diving from April 17th, just a few days after the wreck, to July 10th, so for months, they were dedicating their lives to this, just tirelessly working, and it was, you know, they weren't getting paid for this. They were doing this with their own time. Right. Um, And on July 10th, though, the government actually ordered the civilian divers to stop the operation and to leave the area, which, again, is just like, why did this happen? They were they were bringing the the bodies back because Mm -hmm. the government wouldn't. And they told them to stop. Yeah. Um, And then over the next year, the victims, families and civilian divers worked together to call for the government to investigate the mishandling of the rescue because, I mean, obviously, like we said, it was just handled so poorly, it's hard to even put into words. Mm -hmm. Um, And then new disclosures revealed that the ferry structure made it almost impossible for air pockets to be trapped inside. And the government knew this from the start, but they concealed it from the public. So again, smoke and mirrors, they knew what the hell happened, and they just didn't want people to find Mm -hmm. out. And as we'll find out soon, um, there was a a lot of other structural issues going on um, that I think the government didn't want to take the ferry out of the water because they didn't want to show that like the ferry wasn't up to grit or up to par but we'll get into that um in a minute okay so moving on to december 14th to 16th of 2015 so this is well over a year later almost two years actually um so the first hearings for the sewol ferry disaster happen and the the victims families and the civilian divers questioned the officials that were involved in the rescue for obvious reasons Um, There was a huge candle protest from October 16th to March 20, or sorry, October 2016 to March 2017 um, to impeach President Park for her mishandling for other um, reasons as well. And those involved wore yellow to represent the students that died aboard the Sewol. Um, And after five months, an investigation found her guilty of corruption, blacklisting, and misuse of power. And two weeks after that, she was removed from office 
and um, the salvage of the Sewol began, and this was now three years after its sinking. So like I said, um, the parents were begging for the government to, to um, you know, to take the, the ferry out of the water so they could get the bodies, and so that the damn civilian divers didn't have to keep d diving and giving their lives up to, uh, literally one of them gave his life up, gave his um, life up trying to find the bodies you know so they just they were begging them just please take it out of the water and they wouldn't for three years um and yeah we'll get into president park as well because she was removed from office for obviously like we mentioned for for more than one reason like she was just very corrupt but i think that the like underlying issue was was the civil tragedy and how she handled it and that like people just couldn't get out of their mind like associating her with the tragedy and how she handled it so poorly um, so that definitely had a lasting impact on, I would say like on her presidency, but also I feel like on, I mean, I would imagine South Koreans perception of their government, you know, cause after that happens, it's like, how can you trust your government? They clearly don't care about human life if they're going to do that. Right. Like that's how I would mm -hmm. feel. Um, yeah, we'll get into that a little bit more in a bit. Um, and so, um, uh, uh, so moving on to March 31st of 2017. So this is now three years after the tragedy. Um, the victims' loved ones gathered to watch the Sewol be brought to port. So again, three years later, it was finally taken out of the water. And in two months, more than 100 mobile phones were found in the ferry, which led to critical clues for the investigation. So obviously, this could have been, ha like, done much earlier. And they, you know, there's just, it was just handled so poorly. It's just really, it's awful how it was hand handled. Um, and I think that when I first heard about this case, my first question like the burning question in my mind was just why why did it sink what happened to make it sink right um so there was several things going on so in a 2019 new york times article joe sang hung explained that um the reason was really threefold so first of all there was dangerous renovations that were made to the ferry um, which raised its center of gravity so that was the first thing secondly the ship was unbalanced so um apparently I learned about boats from this a little bit. So apparently um, <laughs> the majority of its ballast water was drained and the ballast water is needed to keep balance. And the reason they drained it, because it seems like, well, why the hell would they drain it if they need it to be balanced, right? So apparently the ship sat too low in the water for what's safe. And so a regulator who was coming by to like inspect the ship, they would see that and they wouldn't approve the ship to be used. So to trick the investigator into um, approving it, they drain the ballast water, which raises the level of the ship, and so that it appeared to be at a safe level. So it looked to the inspectors like it was safe, but in reality, it was very unsafe because not only were there issues making it too low, but they also took out all of the ballast water, which would have kept them balanced. And then the, the, the last, and I think like a really important key part of it was um, it was just simply overloaded. Like we mentioned earlier, there was 50 cars too many, um, and it was also like there was over twice the legal limit of cargo on the ship at the time of its sinking. So it was grossly overloaded. Um, and Cho Sang Hung reported, quote, corrupt regulators bought off by fancy dinners and travel allowed the unsafe ship to sail. Had inspectors taken the time to board the vessel, it would have been hard to miss how grossly overburdened it was. The cheating at every level created a perfect storm. When the Sewol made a sharp churn while fighting a strong current, the badly damaged, or the, sorry, the, the badly balanced ferry began to keel over. The poorly secured cargo started sliding across the decks, forcing the ferry further onto its side. So that just sums up what happened um, and why. Yeah, and I think the w what you said, you know, like the perfect storm really is just, you know, the perfect way to describe it because it's so true. Like there were so many failures at every level, you know, that could have prevented this, you know, and someone even quoted, was quoted as saying, over the coming hours, the rescue operation never in intensified. Not when the passengers were wearing life jackets began to jump ship, not when the ferry tipped near entirely on its side and not when it sank so that only the prow remained above water. And, you know, there were trials later on which found evidence of negligence on the part of the Coast Guard. So, you know, and one of the things that I found out later on, which was so crazy to me, was that a U.S. Navy amphibious assault ship, the USS Bonham Richard, was actually conducting a routine patrol in the Yellow Sea, 
you know, at the time of the sinking of the seawall. And it was only about 100 nautical miles away, and it was ready to offer assistance and originally dispatched two hel helicopters equipped with lifeboats, but it was actually turned away by the Korean Coast Guard. So they just said, um, basically, like, they were assessing the situation and they would wait to ask for assistance from the U.S. Navy. Yeah, when you told me that, like, I had no idea about that, and I got so mad because I was like, so you're telling me that there was like our navy was there and they were ready to help not just like they happen to be there they were there ready to help mm -hmm. and they told them like oh no we have it handled Definitely, and i think yeah. that kind of goes back to like the idea of like just the smoke and mirrors of like we just want to appear like we have it all under control and we don't want to take help mm -hmm. like we want to just handle this on our own and they wouldn't put their pride aside and just save the damn children that were drowning it's just so tragic that they wouldn't take the help even when people were offering it yeah, definitely. You know, like, um, if they had, I just kept keep thinking, you know, like, what if they had allowed them to help, you know, like, how would the situation have changed? Like I said, there are so many things I feel like could have been done differently to prevent such a large loss of life, you know, and there were definitely things that weren't done properly. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's so many what ifs, there's so many, um, there's so many, like, when you listen to the the timeline of events, there's so many places where, you're like, if this had happened differently, if this had happened differently, if it wasn't overloaded, you know what I mean? There's just so many things that could have happened that they, this, like, literally none of these people had to die. It could have been nobody that mm -hmm. died. Um, but instead, so many lives were lost. And it's just tragic to see how many chances they had to make this right before it even happened and while it was happening. And they just chose not to. Yeah, I know. It, it's really sad. Um like you said like they definitely prioritized their image and what they were portraying to the public rather than these children's lives you know like you said they're, they're just high schoolers they definitely had a lot going for them their parents their families definitely so many people were impacted and again it's just so sad to see like the loss of life on such a large scale the way it impacted um the entire country it definitely changed the way people thought for sure yeah, and I think that that is a structural issue with a lot of governments is that they're more concerned with how things look than how mm -hmm. they actually are. So, like, for example, like a, a contemporary example right now, obviously, we're in the midst of the COVID ma like madness, the pandemic. And um, I just saw a tweet from President Trump the other day that he was saying... Um, you know, like our ratings are so high right now, like we're getting so many views every day from like my um, reportings, like we're getting the, the same amount of views as like The Bachelor gets. And I thought that was so crazy that that these pe people are dying all over the world. This is literally a pandemic like we haven't seen in a really long time. Mm -hmm. And the thing he wants to talk about is how how we're, he's getting a lot of views, basically, how he's like clickbait pretty much. And I just think that's so As if sad. he's like some sort of entertainment show or something. Exactly, but this is real life. And it's just exactly like this case where um, they really are concerned with like, how is this going to look? What are we going to tell mm -hmm. the public? How are we going to phrase this? And it's like, dude, screw that. Like, tell them what really happened. Like, take responsibility. Right. And it's just, it's tragic how it was handled, really. Mm -hmm. Right, and so now we're going to move into the fallout of this case. Like, so what, what came of it, right? Um, and one point I wanted to make, first of all, was... Um, it's kind of neither here nor there. I just thought it was interesting to include was that even North Korea offered condolences to um, of, like about the civil tragedy, mm -hmm. which um, I heard a lot of people like when I was looking this up, people were like, oh, they didn't give them their condolences to like over a week later. But I just think it's crazy that North Korea said anything, to be honest, yeah. like from, you know, and this might be like like bias from like being American, like what I hear about North Korea, but everything I hear about them, like, and obviously what they, like their relationship is with South Korea, it's not a good one. Like they're not on yeah. speaking terms, you know what I mean? So the fact that they offered their condolences, I think that just kind of shows the magnitude of this and it shows how tragic this was that even mm -hmm. North Korea like stepped in and was like, oh, that sucks. You know what I mean? Like that's, that really speaks volumes to me. Yeah, definitely. Moving into like, um, what happened with the president, as we mentioned a little bit earlier. So President Park was impeached and removed from office in 2017. And then moving into 2018, she was actually sentenced to 25 years in prison. Um, and just to clarify, this was not because of the civil tragedy. It was many other things that we mentioned earlier that the same reason she was taken out of office. Um, but yeah, it's just interesting that like 
the the tragedy could not be taken away from her name. You know what I mean? Like there was there was no separating mm-hmm. the tragedy from her presidency. So of course that wasn't the reason she was sent to jail, but I know it had like a re- irreversible damage on her presidency. And so she was taken out of office and put in prison. Um, there was a I I didn't know this, but they also have a prime minister. The prime minister stepped down following the tragedy, so he like willingly stepped down. Um, of course we have the diver who committed suicide as we mentioned earlier. And then um, I think another thing that I wanted to mention, we already kind of talked about it, was um, the parents who, I mean, obviously there's never going to be enough that you can do for the parents, but it's just, it sucks mm-hmm. so bad how it was handled for the, from the parents' perspectives that like they were waiting for three long, long years um, for the ferry to, to be taken out of the water so they could at least get some closure on like what happened, um, why this happened, you know, get their children's body so they could lay them to rest and they took three years to do that and it just sucks because they could have done that so much quicker and I truly do think that they were um stalling because they knew that there was problems with the ship they knew that there was corruption going on and that this could have been prevented and they didn't want to show that it was um and that Mm -hmm. sucks it really there's no other way to say it like that is awful yeah And I mean, you know, like I actually saw this documentary on YouTube and we'll link it in our website too. It's just a really well done documentary that I feel like you really empathize with. You can really see the gravity of the situation through this documentary. So we'll link that on the website. But I saw in a clip in that documentary, you know, like um, there were parents obviously waiting at the port for the ferry to be brought in. And there was even this one mother crying and she was basically saying like, oh, I promise um, I'll bring you home to your friends, you know, to her child. And it's just, again, so tragic that they had to wait so long to be able to lay their children to rest. And um, sadly, you know, I believe that there are actually a couple bodies that still to this day haven't been found. And unfortunately, I don't think they ever will be since it has been so long. Yeah, for sure. And that's that I just like can't imagine the tragedy or the the how that feels for the families and parents um, that lost these kids. Mm-hmm. Like I just it's just so tragic that there's like nothing you can say you know what I mean like it's just so sad and so many of them died it's just like when you do watch that that um documentary and you hear these individual cases of kids you know sending their parents their last text saying goodbye mom and dad I love you it's just like oh god like it's Mm -hmm. just too much to even imagine like I can't even wrap my mind around how hard that would be for those parents Yeah, I mean, these kids and these families definitely deserve justice. And like we mentioned before, you know, the president was impeached and she was removed for office for several reasons, you know. Um, But the Seawall tragedy definitely had an impact on her presidency. And I think, um, you know, the major reason is a lot of people definitely um, associated her with this tragedy, her presidency. Um, A lot of it um, with the improper handling of the rescue as well as taking so long to recover the ship as well you know um they really wanted her to be taken out of power badly and you know other people were punished as well um the captain of the ship on november 11 2014 the guangju district court found captain lee jun suk guilty of negligence and sentenced him to 36 years in prison and um the judge said that he was clearly not the only person responsible for the tragedy and they accepted that his negligence did not amount to an intent to kill. And the chief engineer of the ferry was actually found guilty of murder and jailed for 30 years, as well as 13 other crew members were given jail sentences, sentences for up to 20 years on charges including abandonment and violating maritime law. Right, and when I first heard about the sentencing for um, the captain, which was 36 years, as you mentioned, I was like not really sure how to feel about it because when I hear 36 years, I'm like, oh, that's a really long time, like that makes sense. But then um, the mm-hmm. parents who were at the trial, when they heard he, he he got 36 years, they were weeping bitterly. They were so mad. And one mother screamed out, like, it's not fair. What about the lives of our, of our children? And I started thinking about that. Mm-hmm. And I was like, damn, 250 teens were killed. And that amounts to 36 years. Yes. And, or th- yeah, 36 years. So something that I considered was, so the, the captain, I had to look it up. The captain was 69 years old at the time of the tragedy. And so 36 mm-hmm. years means that he would be 105 when, like, when he finished his sentence. So obviously he was going to die in prison. But I think what the, really the issue was, was the principle of, like, 250 children's lives amount to only 36 years, you know? Um, so 
yeah, so I think that's why people were so, so angry with this. And ultimately, in 2015, the ruling was harshened to life in prison for the captain, which, like I mentioned earlier, he was already 69, so he was going to die in prison. But mm-hmm. the fact that his actual sentencing was life in prison, I think that's what really, um, I think it gave people at least a little bit of a closure and they felt a little bit better. But it just sucks because it's not much, you know what I mean? Like, they, like, it's just yeah. this whole case. It's like, yeah, they took the ferry out three years later. Yeah, they gave him life in prison mm-hmm. after they gave him an easier sentence. You know what I mean? Like, they, they, did some things right but not initially they had to go and like backtrack um and yeah that's just indicative of the whole case it was just handled really poorly it goes deep into like corruption um and it's just really disappointing that this happened and i read somewhere also that from you know from this case you'd think that things you know things change like usually when there's a tragedy like like for example when 9 11 happened in america um Mm -hmm. everything changed especially with airlines like you can't travel the same way now and there's all these different rules in place for obvious reasons because we want to prevent another tragedy from happening um but from what i've Mm -hmm. heard i didn't do enough research on this but i heard that like for one article i read um said that not a lot has changed after this. Like, there's still people getting bought off. They're, you know, investing... Or, like, the um the people that would give them the go-ahead and say, like, yeah, your ship is safe. I heard that they're still getting bought mm-hmm. off. There's still... um There's still a lot of corruption in this industry. And right, that just yeah. sucks so bad because it's, like, literally 300 people dying was not enough. Really, mm-hmm. that wasn't enough. Like, it's just so disappointing. It really is, yeah. And I know you mentioned, you know, again, the corruption and that. And I think... You know, that's why we really wanted to mention this story. Again, it is such a huge national tragedy for South Korea, and people still definitely remember it to this day. It's definitely akin to, like, R9-11 for sure. You know, like, again, this is a huge loss of life, and especially for one so young. Again, most of the victims were only in high school. And so, you know, like, unfortunately, I think there will always be a bit of corruption, but it definitely brought um, attention to that after this tragedy. So I think, you know, at least... If there is anything good to come out of this, it's the fact that they were able to um, get rid of a corrupt leader, you know. Um, They definitely got her out of power, so at least hopefully, you know, they did change something for the better. Even if, you know, obviously it doesn't solve everything, there are definitely levels of corruptness in the government, and it'll definitely take a long time to solve, but I think this did go quite a long way in solving that and bringing attention to it for sure and you know like we definitely just wanted to mention this episode like I said because it is so sad it was so tragic and we really feel that like if things were done differently then it wouldn't have been as bad so we definitely wanted to just bring this to people's attentions we didn't really feel like enough people knew about it and we definitely don't want to forget ever you know like the victims of this horrible accident and you know their parents they actually um the their school where they were all supposed the year that they were supposed to graduate they did hold like a um, special memorial ceremony for the students who did not survive so um again you know just this was a very sad story but we definitely felt like it needed to be shared so uh you know that is the end of this episode and if you want more details we'll definitely put up our links on our website so you should definitely go check that out and then you can also follow us on social media on instagram at dark matter pod and our facebook dark matter podcast if you guys want to talk about this you know and just let us know your thoughts right and um i know right now we're all in quarantine so we have lots of time to ourselves so if you do end up listening to the episodes and you enjoy them definitely spread the word tell your friends and family about it and yeah thanks for listening guys and we'll see you next week